President Trump on the offensive against his deep state enemies today revoking the security clearance for former CIA Director John Brennan. And there's word more people could have their clearance yanked. As you know, Brennan and the president have been fighting constantly since before the election. The intel chief has accused President Trump of lying, dividing the nation, and degrading the presidency. And the president always pushing back, calling him a partisan hack with zero credibility. And today, White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders dropped the hammer while reading a statement from the president. Listen. Mr. Brennan has recently leveraged his status as a former high-ranking official with access to highly sensitive information to make a series of unfounded and outrageous allegations, wild outbursts on the Internet and television about this administration. Mr. Brennan's line in recent conduct characterized by increasingly frenzied commentary is wholly inconsistent with access to the nation's most closely held secrets and facilities. Critics are accusing the White House of trying to silence enemies. Today on MSNBC, John Brennan claimed the American people will see right through all of this. John? Mr. Trump has shown himself to be somebody who is, first and foremost, concerned about himself and was concerned about uh, how uh, he uh, appears and, and his, his poll numbers and other things. I am very confident in the resilience of this and the strength of this nation. Uh, Mr. Trump is not going to uh, bring this country down. Uh, I think, in fact, uh, the opposite uh, will, will happen. But is Brennan trying to bring the president down? And was the president right to revoke his security clearance? Should others lose theirs as well? Let me ask former special assistant to President Trump and former press secretary for Vice President Pence. Mark Lauder is back. Welcome back. Good, good evening. Thanks for having me. Uh, so let's discuss this a little bit. I mean, I'm one of those people, I, I feel like there are way too many people who get an inside look at all of these secrets. And of course, with that comes a great deal of power. Uh, the problem is, if you're only selectively cherry picking clearances to revoke, it, it does look like you're punishing your enemies. Why isn't there a longer list that doesn't necessarily include those who've been so vocally opposed to the president? And I think that may be something that, that comes in the future. I think what you're seeing right now is the action taken today by the president shows that, that Director Brennan is not, he doesn't hold the trust of the United States government any longer to hold our nation's secrets. Let's remember, this is a man who lied to Congress about the CIA uh, getting into the computer files of congressional staffers. He misled Congress on a number of other issues that and we can go down a laundry list of them and he doesn't need to he doesn't need the clearance any longer. Yes, and Diane Feinstein who's not necessarily known as a civil libertarian accused the CIA of uh, spying on her and gaining access to her computer as well as other devices and Brandon had to come clean and say, "Yeah, pretty much" and apologize to her, but that's how his CIA was operating. It's really no surprise, but should George Tenet and James Woolsey still have security clearance? Well, and, and I think that we do need to take a look at that. I'll tell you, I had security clearance when I worked in the White House, and when I left the White House, that clearance ended because I didn't need it any longer. And we have to remember that a security clearance is not a right. This is a professional courtesy, and it's used primarily so the successors can talk to their predecessors uh, on areas where there might be some overlap. We're now nearly two years into the, the Trump administration, and I can guarantee you that there is nobody at the highest levels of the CIA that want to talk to John Brennan right now about anything that would be confidential. Um, uh, Mark Warner has been incredibly critical of the president for this, and uh, you know I, I do think the White House has to be careful, A, not to appear vindictive, and also uh, not just wagging the dog trying to get Omarosa off the front page because she has been eclipsing the news cycle for three days now. Where do we go from here with this conversation to make sure that it is a rational one grounded in uh, good decisions and constitutional stewardship? Well, maybe we need to look at, as opposed to automatically extending it, the courtesy, that we automatically revoke the clearances unless the agency can make a strong case for why it should be continued, and it needs to be beyond 
just a professional courtesy. When you look at the rest of the list that the president announced today is under review, we have people who were at the top levels of the FBI who have now been disgraced, in many cases fired, demoted, for their inappropriate activities using the power of the police, the power of the state to spy on political campaigns. They should not have clearance. And so maybe we need to look into this fundamentally in a long-term thing, and I think this is just the beginning of yeah, it. Yeah, and I think both sides are looking at opposition research now as a form of domestic spying they really are and and again that's an incredible uh, amount of information that uh, also equates to an incredible amount of power now those who are pushing back like James Clapper again a known liar someone who's gone before Congress and essentially perjured himself they're saying that this is a First Amendment issue I don't have a problem with former heads of various intelligence agencies or members of past administrations uh, talking critically about this president or any other I understand that you know we're in a hyper politicized age where everyone has an opinion and everyone feels entitled Entitled to express it on TV or on social media. I, I get that. But, you know, if, if Brennan is talking about presidential comportment, there has to be something equally said for the comportment of a former CIA director. No, I agree with you completely, and, and we need to remember that that clearance, by its continuation, says that we that you have the full faith and trust of the United States government in holding and having our national secrets. By revoking that clearance, nothing will stop him from going on other cable networks and continuing to rant and rail against this administration or any other administration. He's already prohibited from talking about classified information, and that will continue whether he has his clearance or not. All all this does is say you cannot have access to current and new information and and that's where we are going to stop that flow if there is any flow it would now be illegal to talk to him about yeah. national security issues well uh, people like John Brennan feel like they know better than everyone else and they are smarter than uh, the average voter Mark Lauder thanks so much thank you the fate of former Trump campaign manager Paul Manafort now in the hands of a jury Deliberation set to begin tomorrow morning on Robert Mueller's biggest case yet in the Russia investigation. Manafort is looking at the rest of his life in prison if he's found guilty here. Edward Lawrence in Washington with more details. Edward. Uh, Kennedy, you said the prosecution rested. You know, the defense rested without calling a single witness. We had closing arguments. So Paul Manafort's attorney said the prosecutor just did not make their case. I believe the government has failed to meet their burden of proof, and we've rested on that. We live in the United States of America, and you're presumed innocent until proven guilty. And we believe the government cannot meet that burden. Now, prosecutors outlined how Manafort and his uh, former partner Rick Gates created a scheme to hide $60 million in income from the IRS. They tried to show how they then lied to the special counsel when asked about those transactions. The defense saying that Gates made Manafort a fall guy when he got caught cheating on his wife and stealing money from Manafort. Attorneys also said that they tried to say this was all politicized by the special counsel's office. The jury received instructions tonight. Now, as you said, it's headed to the jury. Deliberations will start. Start at 9.30 tomorrow morning, Eastern Time. Kennedy? No, oh, mercy! It will be <laughs> very interesting to see what happens there and how long they take to deliberate. Uh, they, they essentially were missing half the story, so it's going to be a lot less to go over than your average trial. Edward Lawrence, thank oh, you so much. I yeah. know it'll be a fly on the wall in that uh, jury room, huh? Mm, I'm sure <laughs> Elmarosa is probably recording it somehow. <laughs> Edward, thank you. Thanks, Kennedy. Now, meantime, Rudy Giuliani has a new message for Robert Mueller, who's still investigating President Trump and his ties to Russia. That message is, quote, write the damn report. Today, the president's attorney tweeted, quote, CNN poll shows 66 percent say Mueller should complete his investigation before the upcoming elections. DOJ has policy to refrain from investigatory activity in 60-day period before election. DOJ should require Mueller to submit his report before September 7. Now, if Mueller doesn't wrap things up soon, is he at risk of, as Giuliani puts it, quote, polling a Comey and interfering in the midterms? Let me ask former Trump campaign manager and author of Let Trump Be Trump. It is Corey Lewandowski. He's also a senior strategist at Vice President Pence's PAC Great America. Uh, welcome back, Corey. Thank you for having me. So what do you make of this strategy and the president's attorney sort of forcing the timeline of special counsel? 
Look, I think what Ju uh, Mayor Giuliani is doing is asking for a conclusion to something that's now been going on for two years. The American people deserve a conclusion. And if the Mueller investigators have found something, any type of evidence, that they should write that report and present it to the Department of Justice so we can go on with it. But there hasn't been any. There is no evidence. There is no collusion. There's no cooperation, no coordination between the Russians and the Trump campaign. And so let's end this investigation. Let's save the taxpayers money. And let's not bring this through the midterm elections because that is a disservice to the country. All right. But if it does go into and past the midterms, is there any way that benefits the president? Look, I don't think this investigation benefits or hurts the president either way, as particularly at the ballot box. But what I do think is the American people are tired of it. There has been not one scintilla of evidence that the president or our team did anything wrong to impact the outcome of the election. The only team that was trying to impact the outcome of the election through nefarious means was the Clinton campaign. They're the ones that took millions of dollars, paid a former spy mm -hmm. to go put together a false dossier. And there's not been one prosecution from that so far. So that's where I think the Mueller team should be investigating, which is the real crime, which is the Clinton collusion. Yeah, okay, Corey, um, the thing I like about you is your honesty. And I, I want to pose a hypothetical. Say you're on a pleasure cruise with Paul Manafort and El Marosa. The thing is sinking. You obviously have your life jacket on because you're a responsible boater. Uh, neither of them do. Neither of them know how to swim. You've only got one life jacket left. Who do you throw it to? I'd love to see the dog fight between the two of them, to tell you the truth. I don't know who would win or lose, but uh, I think it would be a great fight to watch. And my guess is Omarosa comes out on top. Interesting. So she's the one who survives. Uh, as you watch the Manafort trial unfold, do you think his side was smart to rest without calling anyone? Well, I'm not an attorney, but let me say this. I think he's received a fair trial. I don't know who he would have called as a potential defense witness in this case to say that he did pay his taxes because I think the burden of proof is now clearly there that shows that he made tens of millions of dollars, had that money in offshore accounts, and the jury is going to look at the evidence that's presented and come back with a fair verdict in that case. So I don't even know who Paul Manafort or his defense team could have called to help him mm -hmm. out of this because there's nobody there who could justify that Paul didn't know the money was there. Oh, he knew the money was there. Absolutely. Of course he did. But but is that is that the purview of special counsel? I mean, shouldn't it have been up to another government agency to do this sort of investigation and prosecution? Look, I, I agree with you, and I think everything that Paul Manafort has been accused of in these crimes, these 18 count indictment, has nothing to do with his tenure with the Trump organization. It preceded that time by at least 10 years, and this probably should have been referred to a uh, U.S. attorney's office somewhere to go after him for those crimes. That wasn't the case, and now we're going to see what the jury says. When they deliberate tomorrow, I don't think we're going to be waiting for the jury to come back four or five days. I think it's going to be a fairly quick verdict. You think, okay, so... Uh uh, the over-under is like an hour and a half. I think that's how long the OJ jury deliberated. Uh, what do you take in the over, the under with this jury? Uh, I'll take the over, but under eight hours. Under eight hours. Okay, so you think we're going to have something tomorrow. Um, now, you despise Paul Manafort, and uh, you think that he is a, a user and a life wrecker and uh, a scummy agent, perhaps, of the devil. Do you think he's going to be found guilty or not guilty? You know, I don't know. And look, I wouldn't want to see anybody's lives ruined. Um, and, and look, the real question is, has Paul been treated fairly because of his association with Donald Trump? And I don't know. Look, Paul and I aren't friends, but I think it's very difficult to have a white collar criminal mm -hmm. in jail now uh, for a tax evasion charge. And look, I think the case is probably proved beyond a shadow of a doubt. It's not for me to say. It's for the jury to say. But spending the rest of your life in jail is a harsh penalty for anybody. And while I'm not a fan of Paul's, mm -hmm. I don't know if that punishment fits the crime. Did the president have you sign an NDA when you worked for him? I signed an NDA right at the very beginning of my tenure with the Trump Organization back in January of 2015. Do you think that Omarosa's NDA is enforceable? I think her NDA as it relates to her tenure at the campaign and probably the transition is enforceable. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm not an attorney. I don't know how you can prevent a government employee from providing information after they leave government service. I don't know how enforceable an NDA is as it relates to government employees. All right. So you, there's obviously a difference between working on the campaign and working in the administration. Uh, you know, in the private sector, we, we see these kind of agreements all the time. I will be uh, very curious to see if hers is in fact enforceable. And if it's not, 
I think there are plenty of people who, you know, when they jump ship and leave the administration, will want to capitalize in the exact same way. Uh, is she right in saying that, that people who leave are given a $15,000 a month job, a no-show job? You know, I, I don't believe that to be true at all. And look, I think what has happened in the past, and look, the campaign is now going after Omarosa in arbitration for her violation of her tenure during the campaign, not as her violation as a government employee. So it's a very fair distinction to make. Mm -hmm. As a private entity, th they believe that she has breached that non-disclosure agreement. I think they're very right in that, and they will seek that penalty in arbitration. Look. People leave the administration all the time and aren't given positions, aren't paid. They offered Omarosa an additional opportunity mm -hmm. to continue to be a forward-facing resource for the campaign, a spokesperson. She chose not to do that, and instead wow. she decided to burn a bridge and make up salacious statements about the president, which she, we know she are clearly unfounded. Uh, who would you rather see in prison, Omarosa or Paul Manafort? Oh, look, I don't think Omarosa deserves to be in prison, to be honest with you. And I think Paul's going to have his day, if not tomorrow, uh, in the very near future, if not this trial, the next one. Well, we will see. Corey Lewandowski, thank you so much. Thank you. Coming up, socialism has failed in every country where it's been tried. So why is Bernie Sanders still trying to convince us that it works, even after voters continue to reject his ideas at the ballot box? John Stossel joins me to give the senator a reality check. That's next. Welcome back. Democratic socialists have not exactly been setting the world on fire at the ballot box. But last night, Uncle Bernie Sanders told Stephen Colbert there's more to life than winning primaries. Okay. I think the real issue is that the ideas that we have been talking about, almost without exception, Stephen, are now ideas that are mainstream ideas that are supported by the vast majority of the American people. You hear that? The vast majority. So uh, that must be why every single socialist candidate endorsed by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez lost in the primaries, as did half the candidates Bernie endorsed. Colbert urged Sanders to drop the word socialist from his platform because of the negative connotations associated with the word. But of course, that didn't add up for Bernie because socialists are bad at math. So was Bernie right to insist that socialism is the wave of the future? Let me ask my next guest, Fox Business Network's John Stossel. Uh, it's very interesting because there is a disconnect here between utopia and history. And they, they don't seem to grasp that. And, and when you try and explain to democratic socialists the ills of socialism and the millions of people who have died, they say, well, that's not real socialism. It's not real socialism. And look at Sweden and Denmark and Northern Europe. They take care of people. Mm. Well, that's not socialism, because those countries don't allow the government to run the economy, and they do have a slightly bigger welfare state. Mm -hmm. But Sweden's cutting back on it, and the only reason they work at all is because they had underlying capitalism to make it work, and a bunch of people who have a work ethic. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, we were talking about this earlier in the week. Danish leader Rasmussen said in 2015, no, we have a market economy. We don't have a, a state-run centralized economy, which is implicit in a socialist system. And uh, you're absolutely right. Sweden has been making free market reforms for several years now. They're higher on the economic freedom list than we are. All those countries are. Oh. Isn't, that, isn't that unbelievable? The United States actually ranks lower because even though we have a tax cut, we've got so much spending in this country. And, and we also have Yes. And it's awful, but I don't agree with you about the popularity. Just the fact that lots of these people lost, mm -hmm. there are other factors. I think it, people are economically ignorant, and this free stuff and health care for everyone yeah. appeals to people. Well, and, and now uh, Elizabeth Warren is talking about uh. her new bill, the Accountable Capitalism Act. And you talk about a state-run economy. Uh, there are now so much, so many different ways she wants the government to keep corporations in check. And, and they don't realize that when you add new regulations, you actually throw the brakes on what could be thriving industries. But they love that. They love that. And do you think it's an accident that the most exciting innovation in America happened in the two 
metropolitan areas farthest from Washington, D.C., Silicon Valley and Seattle, mm -hmm. before they had any lobbyists. The government didn't know what was going on. Once government is in there setting rules, innovation stops. And her act is any company with more than a billion dollars in sales. Mm -hmm. All right, well, first of all, a lot of companies with 900 million in sales say, you know, let's hire a bunch of lawyers and split off. Why would we want to get bigger? Yeah. Just to have a Elizabeth form of, of corporate structuring and telling us what to do. Yeah. And then 40% of the votes now have to be for the employees. So the employees vote themselves big pay raises. The companies are no longer efficient and they don't innovate because that might involve firing some employees. And in a, you get innovation stops, you get a stagnant puddle. Yeah, and, and then you introduce things like automation. And it's it's the exact same well, you thing. Don't introduce a, a slightly different mechanism than the forced fifteen dollar minimum wage laws that socialists are also pushing, uh, which, you know, will kill entire sectors and keep people who need jobs the most out of the workplace. And entry level jobs won't be available to the people who need them most. Yeah. Unemployment's at 4%. If, if workers feel they're not being treated fairly by their company, they have choices now. Finally. And Elizabeth says pay isn't going up, but she's just wrong. It is. No, hourly pay especially is going up. That's the thing they're, they're fighting for and they're actually fighting against. And you're absolutely right. They're bad at basic economics. Therefore, they shouldn't be in charge of the economy. Ignorant, but arrogant, too. <laughs> what, what a couple of attributes. John Stossel, thank you so much. Great Thanks. to see you. You look fantastic. Why, thank you. I'm recovering from my broken jaw. I know, man. But I'm not smiling here, you notice. <laughs> not showing my missing teeth. <laughs> Don't worry. A couple of ninjas found him in the parking lot. Uh, coming up, the president of Turkey squaring off with the United States, refusing to release an American pastor. I'll explain why Erdogan might be underestimating President Trump's resolve in my monologue next. despise the Erdogan, let me count the ways the Turkish president is putting his country in a diplomatic pickle by refusing to free an American pastor over terrorism charges. The fake crime is a bunch of hot malarkey, a rancid plate of Turkish non-delight, and although Erdogan has been concentrating his power through fake elections, imprisoning journalists and purging academics, he didn't bet that he'd be strong-armed by another strongman. Our president has had it up to his eyeballs with Turkey's trolling, and instead of empty words, President Trump is offering a full-throated digital slap to Erdogan, tweeting, quote, I have just authorized a doubling of tariffs on steel and aluminum with respect to Turkey, as their currency, the Turkish lira, slides rapidly downward against our very strong dollar. Aluminum will now be 20% and steel 50%. Our relations with Turkey are not good at this time. When were they ever good? The Turkish government is a disgrace, and past administrations have either coddled them or sat idly by while they rolled out the welcome mat and threw the door open for ISIS, all while cozying up to Russia. This is not our strategic partner. This is a corrupt, murderous regime that should be kicked out of NATO for a host of human rights violations, not to mention deep-kissing the Russians, who are supposedly the biggest regional threat. Now, sure, there have been counter threats. Now, Erdogan is saying he'll pull the iPhone off the market as if the people there could use the device to mobilize, enrich themselves or seek freedom from a regime that wants total control and is willing to tank the global economy to prove a childish point. And while we're at it, and while the president is hot under the collar, if he really wants to make his new party pal, Kim Kardashian, happy, he should officially and once and for all acknowledge the Armenian genocide, which was not an issue or a series of unfortunate events, but a cold-blooded slaughter of 1.5 million people whose memory will not be erased by any Napoleonic nincompoop. Release Pastor Andrew Brunson, President Erdogan, and fear the stash. Bolton is mongering. So for the sake of world peace, put up and shut up so you don't get blown up. And that's the memo. Ooh, look at that. Today at the White House, Press Secretary Sarah Sanders, she did not mince words about Turkey. Watch. We feel that uh, 
uh, Turkey and specifically President Erdogan have treated Pastor Brunson, who we know to be a uh, very good person and a strong Christian who's done nothing wrong, very unfairly, very badly, uh, and it's something that we won't forget in the administration. Now, I don't want a war with Turkey. I hope nobody does. So will the Turks cave in to President Trump? Joining me now, former aide to President Reagan and senior fellow at the Cato Institute. Doug Bandow joins me. Welcome back, Doug. Hi, happy to be on. Uh, so let's discuss this a little bit. I don't know why every administration foists Turkey upon the United States as though they're some great ally. Uh, they've lied to us for years. Erdogan has gotten worse and worse and worse, and he has done horrible things to lots of people, as you point out, namely the Kurds. Well, we've tended to view them through rose-colored glasses. We want to say that they're a, a linchpin for the region. You know, they have a base that we use. We view them as democratic despite what's going on. All of these are arguments for the past. What we see today is an authoritarian government and one that's operating very negatively from our own security interests. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and uh, this president... Erdogan has gotten worse and worse and worse. And, you know, I understand we have a base, but they have certainly misused their military capability. And, you know, we, we shouldn't be operating under the auspices that, that ISIS has been handled or smothered because they're still very much proliferating, and a good deal of that responsibility rests on Turkey's shoulders. No, as you pointed out in your uh, <clears throat> opening memo, I mean, they helped support ISIS in the early stages of the war. I mean, they helped it increase in size. They were far more concerned about our allies, the Kurds, than about ISIS. We need to remember we're the superpower, not them. We, we sh they need us far more than we need them. Uh, NATO has become obsolete and ridiculous. When you have, as you pointed out, an authoritarian regime that is cozying up with Russia, how on earth can we justify uh, their staying in NATO when maybe the whole thing should be disbanded? Yeah, we can't trust them. I mean, do we want them to have secrets? We have, we have nuclear weapons at our base there. We should be pulling those out. This is a very bad situation. The human rights is awful as well. And it's not just Pastor Brunson. He's the most obvious victim. Mm -hmm. Something like 15 Americans have been arrested. There are all those kind of charges. There's a NASA engineer. I mean, it's extraordinary what's been happening over there in the name of democracy. And in the name of terrorism, because that's what, uh, that's what this president does. He claims that academics and journalists are guilty of terrorism, and you've got 70 journalists in Turkey right now rotting in jail. And uh, I have a feeling it's not the most pristine conditions. You know, ha have you ever been in a Turkish prison is not exactly something <laughs> you say to a well, young man. Remember the movie Midnight Express. We kind of saw what those conditions were like. Yes. Uh, Doug, what's going to happen here? What do you see happening with this administration in regards to Turkey? Well, it's very hard for Erdogan to back down. He's posed as the great nationalist, but his economy is in trouble, and it's primarily in trouble because of his own policies. They've had rapid monetary growth. They've weakened the economy. They've set themselves up for this. Mm -hmm. You know, so the confrontation with the U.S. set off a lira, you know, crash. Uh, they're going to be in real trouble, and if he loses on the economy, then he's going to lose some of his support. People voted for him because they thought he was helping them. All right. Doug, thanks so much for your time. Appreciate it. Happy to be on. Very good. New York Democratic governor and potential 2020 contender Andrew Cuomo shocking a lot of people with his thoughts on the nation. Andy? We're not going to make America great again. It was never that great. <laughs> we have not reached greatness. We will reach greatness when every American is fully engaged. What the hell does that mean? And what on earth was he thinking? The New York governor's spokesperson tried to temper his comment shortly afterward by saying the governor believes America is great and that her full greatness will be fully realized when every man, woman, and child has full equality. I think the governor is full of hot garbage. But will this sentiment come back to haunt him? Could this be his moment of deplorables? The panel is here to discuss. She is the editor at townhall.com and a Fox News contributor. Katie Pavlich is back along with comedian Jimmy Fela and Democratic strategist and attorney Danielle McLaughlin. Welcome, everyone. Hey, hey, Hello. hey. Hello. Uh, Katie, I will start with you because this is one of those <laughs> moments where this is like crumbs and deplorables. <laughs> 
It's worse than that. Because, look, you can disagree with President Trump and his language and the way that he talks about people and maybe some of his unpresidential behavior. Mm -hmm. But to attack America is not great. It reminds me a lot of when President Obama said, look, America's great just like the Greeks think that uh, Greek, Greece is exceptional, America is exceptional just like that. America is the greatest country in the history of the world. It has brought so many people out of poverty. There are millions of people who have tried to come here and died as a result of trying to get here for that freedom. And so for him to attack uh, the country in a diverse place like New York, yeah. where Ellis Island resides, where my family came through in the early 1900s for freedom and a new life and prosperity in a place where an idea made everybody equal for opportunity, it really just is like, gosh, make a better argument. Well, it's also kind of heartbreaking because yeah. this is also uh, where, you know, the, the greatest atrocities on 9-11 were perpetrated. Right and I, I know a lot of people who actually enlisted because of 9-11 right. because they love this country so much. Yeah. They want to protect freedom and maintain it. And they, they really threw themselves literally into the battlefield for that protection. This is a big mistake. This is the kind of gaffe that could get Cynthia Nixon all the way up to five percent in the polls <laughs> this could she could almost break single digits if he keeps this up but that he's a something dope. to talk about a that, that'd be a big one news yeah. but what Bob a dope i mean his biggest political accomplishment at this point is not being in jail everybody he's surrounded with has kind of gone up the river and made license plates at this point so they have a unique perspective yeah. on america but this is the problem with having a policy that's just a blanket opposition to someone else yeah, they're, right. they're just running against trump and sometimes when you just oppose everything they do you wind up saying mindlessly stupid but things like this yeah. without regard for and, how and popular they are. It, it's so dismissive. It, it's not supportive. It's not positive. And this is someone who has presidential aspirations. Sure. Uh, to your point, Jimmy, I think this was him railing against the Make America Great Again brand. Mm -hmm. And clearly what he meant was not that this place is a terrible place, that we still have issues to work through. Sure. But to your and point about... And there's right. no doubt about that. Right. And that is a valid argument. Right. I understand that. But to say the country has never been great... Right. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, we are the beneficiaries of the post-World War II order. We are the great economic power of the 20th and 21st century. So there is absolutely greatness here. But, you know, it's going to be like deplorables. It will be truncated. It will be used yeah. against them by political enemies. And this is going to be like stamped across his forehead uh, for years. And, and, and even if, if you take the statement apart, like, what does fully engaged mean? What, what does that mean? And that's the thing. It's like, okay, so lay out a plan so for what, what exactly that means. So if you have 100% right. voter <laughs> engagement that, that somehow that we're, well, America we're, sucks and was, we should just give up? Was, was, exactly. Like, what's the, the, the strategic uh, analysis he has there of how to actually get America to a place where he believes that every man, woman, and child it's is fully, equal, right? I mean, there's no uh, actual... Fully engaged. Fully engaged. Yeah. I think like, in the he's, womb, he's, you're going to be voting for president, No, I think right? he's, he's running on a uh, arranged marriage platform. He wants <laughs> yeah. everybody wants everybody hit. Just because it worked for you, Jimmy. Yeah. Yeah. Andrew. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> is his spokesperson tried to, like, clean it up a little bit, yeah. but he... This is bad enough that he needs to come out and actually clear yeah. up exactly what I mean, look, Michelle Obama wasn't president. She said, for the first time in my life, I'm, I'm proud of this right. country. And then those things like that, uh, they, they can come back to haunt you because you just give your enemies Too leverage. And they and should. Yeah, they yeah. should come back to And when you're explaining, you. you're losing. Yeah. Golden role of, of politics, right? That's right. Don't explain anything. No, I'm not explaining <laughs> anything. Except for uh, coming up, we have millennial women. They have the power. Hi, good to see you. Uh, to sway the midterms this November, but a new poll says that doesn't necessarily mean a blue wave is coming. The panel returns to explain after the break. So luscious. Is the future really female? There's no denying that feminism has become quite a trend over the past few years. But according to a new survey, a shocking number of millennial women don't actually align themselves with the feminist movement. The Refinery29 and CBS News poll found that 54% of millennial women don't consider themselves feminists, while only 46% do. And it's because they feel like they're not reflected in the current movement. So how will this translate at the ballot box in November? The panel is back. Katie Pavlich, Jimmy Fela, and Danielle McLaughlin. Uh, I will ask you, I think that um, these are some interesting statistics 
that uh, reflect that millennials once again proved to be the most politically interesting group of mm. people in the country, and they they don't adhere to these boxes and pens no, that the no. aging establishment wants them in. No, they don't. And I guess the big question is, will they vote? Right? Will yeah. they make their voices heard in the midterms in 2020? I thought the split between the ages was interesting. I also thought the, the split between Democrat and Republican, a lot more women identified as feminists who are Democrats, but they defined feminism very differently. Mm -hmm. So Democrats defined de uh, um, feminism as equality, political, eco uh, economic, social equality. But Republicans tended to associate feminism with blaming men for stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was actually shocked that 29% of Republicans you know, identified that way because who wants to identify well, I mean, blaming it, it men for stuff? It depends who is the face of the movement, but it certainly yeah. can feel that way. Yeah. And, and yes. that's off-putting, especially if you are an individualist and oh. you believe in the right of the individual, yes. regardless of gender or race mm -hmm. or other immutable qualities. Well, I think that's what's stifling the movement and identity politics as a whole, is there's a lot of self-respecting people who just want to be recognized for their character, for the right. quality of their work, and they don't really want to be boxed up and grouped. And to a bigger point, and this is something a lot of women say to me um, and have a hard time articulating, um, they feel like modern feminism in a lot of ways is infantilizing women. And what I mean by that is it's not an empowering message when you say, oh, a woman can't consent to hook up with a boss. I'm not talking about physical assault. I'm talking about casual courtship now being characterized right. as, as predatory, uh, almost deviant, uh, illegal behavior. And, and you really right. see that on college campuses. Yeah, that's exactly. a big thing now. And, uh, and there's been no regard for due process, and they're treating these women like they can't make their own decisions, and it's frustrating. And for that reason, and the fact that I am married, and I don't have to pretend to be a feminist, I am not a feminist. So what's driving this? Look, I think that uh, for a long time, feminism has been sold as an all-inclusive movement for all women. And mm. over the years, we've actually the seen that that's yeah. not true. Political no. Right, that that's actually not true at all. You hear all the time, mm -hmm. you know, women have to support women no matter the politics. But when it actually Special comes down to hell. it, yeah, conservative <laughs> women are not welcome in liberal circles. And quite frankly, yeah. as a conservative woman myself, I don't really want to tolerate the liberal ideas of, of, of women in terms of accepting them as my own and being a feminist simply uh -huh. because it happens to be coming from another woman. Mm -hmm. I think millennials especially value individualism, as you were saying. They want to be on their own, and they reject this group think, which is exactly what feminism is. And it presents itself as something you have to join, or else you are a bad person, yeah. you're misogynist, and you're sexist. It, it is the or else that I think is really opening. Thank right. you so much, Danielle, so much Jimmy, fun. and Katie. What a great night. All right, Topical Storm is next. Stay here. A group of doctors are warning that vaping is more dangerous to your health than previously thought. That's because when you do it, everyone wants to punch you in the face. Stick that in your cotton candy scented pipe and smoke it because this is the topical storm. Topic number one. We begin tonight at Dodger Stadium where the home team lost last night, but they put up one heck of a fight. Doyers. Oh, look at that. Giants catcher Nick Hunley said some naughty things to Yasiel Puig. And the good news is, a Dodger finally got a hit with a man on base. The bad news is, he'll probably get suspended for it. L.A. fans were shocked by the violence, but at the same time, it was nice to see people fighting somewhere beside Donald Trump's star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Plenty of Bush League plays there. Both players were ejected from the game, and Major League Baseball is pondering. Disciplinary action, ponderous. They'll announce their decision once they get a recording of the conversation from Omarosa. Topic number two. A biker in San Antonio has done the impossible. No, he didn't find a way to pay for Bernie Sanders' health care bill, but he did pull off his own crazy stunt. Watch this. Superman. This trick is called the Superman because the biker is flying on his stomach like the Man of Steel. And if I had to guess, I'd say he's also flying on a few other things because this is all kinds of dangerous. One pothole and Superman will be in the obit section of the Daily Planet. Of course, this isn't the most dangerous superhero stunt to take place on a motorcycle. There's also one called the Batman, where you dress up as Ben Affleck and all the comic book fans throw stuff at you. And you can't blame them. I wouldn't watch Ben Affleck play Batman at gunpoint. Seriously. Where's Gotti when you need it? That thing's a masterpiece to, compared to Ben Affleck as dumb Batman. What a horrible choice. Anyhow, topic number three. I dig. Speaking of dangerous, 
Let's head out to Newark, New Jersey, where a TSA agent is going viral. And for once, it's not because he rifled through someone's luggage. A little boy challenged this agent to a dance-off, and the result is a feel-good video that's been seen over two million times. That works out to one for every weapon people snuck past security while they danced. The dance-off has certainly won the hearts of most Americans, but not everyone agrees on it. Come on, man. You can't just go punching people you disagree with. This is a baseball game, not an Antifa rally. Oh, did you see all those doy so? Woo! Outnumbered. It's not good. Topic number four. Massachusetts has all kinds of fun things to do in the summer. But one family's vacation has totally jumped the shark. Watch this. Holy yeah, you watch your language, Pops. Dad was teaching his son how to fish when he got a surprise. It was a visit from a great white. There are plenty of things I could say at this point, but I think Dad said it best. Holy spit is right. And this story definitely hits home for me because back in college, I lost all my clothes to a card shark. <laughs> best night of my life. Chafed a little, though. The Internet was amazed at how the boy kept his composure during the incident, but the kid doesn't scare easy. Just look at him riding his bike to school. He'll be tripping. he be tripping, yo! For what it's worth, the cops are going to catch this guy soon because these days all superhero movies require a sequel. Topic number five. <laughs> Finally, two Connecticut lunch ladies have been busted for reportedly skimming nearly a half million dollars from their school cafeteria. That's a lot of bread. The women denied any financial wrongdoing and are referring all questions to their accountant, Bernie Madoff. New Canaan police say these two lunch broads oversaw the lunchroom and allegedly convinced cashiers to let them count all the money at the end of the day. And wouldn't you know it, $478,000 went missing. Both women were arrested and released on $50,000 bond, which they paid with crumpled up money. A lot of people have wondered where security was during all of this, and we obtained the surveillance video. Uh-huh. Yeah, there they were. Dance off, pants off. Weirdos. These two dance like my assistant Teddy during our meetings. He needs to cut down on the Starbucks and the Jameson. We'll be right back. The fact is, there are over 9,600 roads named Park in the U.S., it's America's most popular street name, but all state agents know that's where the similarity stops. If you're on Park Street in Reno, Nevada, the high winds of the Washoe Zephyr could damage your sighting. And that's very different than living on Park Avenue in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, where ice dams could cause water damage. But no matter what park you live on, one of 10,000 local all state agents.